Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Strategy at Work session on social impact and purpose, new pillars of transformation. I hope all of you and your families are safe and well, and I'm delighted to welcome uh, two distinguished guests to this discussion that is, I believe, incredibly important and timely. My first guest is Ifoso Ojomo. He researches and writes about how innovation can transform organizations and create inclusive prosperity for many. Alongside uh, business guru Clayton Christensen, who co-authored the book, The Prosperity Paradox, How Innovation Can Lead Nations Out of Poverty. We are also joined from Brazil by Carolina de Costa, who is a partner at MOA Asset Management for new, and who looks at new business and funding models to support entrepreneurship, ESG goals, and business impact. She has over 20 years of experience in high growth, nonprofit, and social impact projects, and brings a wealth of experience in technology, um, innovation, and ecosystem thinking. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's good to be Pleasure here. Pleasure to be here. So let me just dive right in. I mean, the global economic crises, prevailing pandemics, and climate change have really furthered the divide between the haves and have nots. Um, you know, and pre-COVID, we've almost had 20 years of business agonizing over these issues of profit versus impact, stakeholder versus shareholder, man versus machine. And what we've seen that COVID has done is really created an acceleration of these longstanding debates. Um, so there are firms who have embraced this and maybe have some insight into how to bring this thinking into their organizations. But today, the necessity of doing so is becoming more visible to everyone. So if I were to start today, how would I think about really incorporating these ideas of social impact and purpose into my organization? Uh, Carolina, let me start with you. I think beginning to look at social impact as part of the strategic agenda and not something that is isolated or treated as disruption. I know Efosa is very close to Clay Christensen and himself used to say that people use the word disruption much more often than actually it, it, it is indeed a disruption. And I like to approach this agenda as an as evolu evolutionary agenda uh, in the sense that uh, it has to be seen as value added to the business. So part of the strategy, convergent with the mission and um, um, understood as something even more than ever visible to society. So consumers and investors, so I'm from the side of investors nowadays, are looking very closely to how material is the account accountability with the agenda. So in a nutshell, and going very straightforward to, to your question, I would say that it has to be for real because everybody's looking now and looking very attentively. Absolutely. Ifosa, how do you think about this? Uh, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with uh, Carolina. Uh, I think uh, when you look at uh, sort of social impact initiatives, uh, social uh, agendas of different organizations and corporations, uh, it often falls into uh, what, uh, you know, Harvard Business School professor George Serafim calls a box ticking culture. It's let's uh, design all these initiatives and let's tick the box. Uh, but if we're really going to make change, uh, it has to move from a box ticking initiative uh, to a strategic initiative, uh, which means uh, the organization, as it thinks about growth uh, and sustainability, uh, it cannot uh, not think about uh, some of the social impact uh, that it's, it's trying to, um, to en enforce um, or realize. Uh, the, the thing, though, that's uh, troubling uh, or difficult is that uh, social impact um, is incredibly difficult to uh, define, uh, and it's incredibly difficult to understand. Uh, so I think as we uh, continue on the conversation, it'd be great for us to 
uh, to try to talk about what, what do we mean, uh, right, by social impact, because uh, so many different organizations would define that term uh, differently. Uh, and so it's important to have a common language uh, to help us uh, be on the same page. I, I think that absolutely is um, a huge issue um, across sectors. And on the other hand, it's really an opportunity for firms to differentiate themselves and to create unique strategies. Um, if I look at just this week, REI, which was very much ahead on the sustainability agenda, announced that um, they had completed a 14-year commitment that they had made on um, reducing um, and becoming carbon neutral, excuse me. And they have pledged now that by 2030, they want to reduce their carbon footprint by 50%. And we see many of the other announcements. So this is an interesting uh, new paradigm because earlier a lot of companies said that having to satisfy the quarterly demands of markets was a huge impediment to them doing initiatives and, and uh, starting projects that they believed could widen their impact. And today you see kind of an interesting combination where people are understanding they have to deliver results, but also pledging to do things that are more far reaching with defined timetables, but self-defined ones. So how do we actually kind of understand impact and, and how much influence do companies have to define and shape the agenda? Uh, if also, let me start with you. Yeah, I mean, I think um, as with many issues, right, it all starts with leadership. Uh, leadership from the investor uh, side of things, uh, which rolls onto the board of directors, uh, which influence the CEOs, uh, which ultimately would influence the, uh, the employees in the organization. Uh, so I think leadership is key uh, as we think about sort of this paradigm shift uh, that we're all calling for. Uh, but before we even sort of dive into, into the how, um, I'd love to, to just uh, provide some kind of framework uh, for understanding what this uh, notion of social impact is. You know, every human being, every organization has a footprint, uh, whether it's an environmental footprint, a financial footprint, a social uh, footprint, uh, by the things that we do uh, when we wake up in the morning uh, and go about our daily lives. Um, and so from an organization standpoint, uh, it's very easy to measure financial, uh, the financial footprint, right? Um, how much are you spending uh, and how much are you making? Uh, which I think is why so many uh, metrics exist to measure financials because it's relatively easy. And that's how many uh, leaders uh, and employees uh, get measured. Uh, it's the financial metrics. With the social, it becomes uh, tricky, it becomes funny because you've got the employees uh, that are gonna be impacted. Uh, you've got customers uh, that are impacted in some way. You've got investors uh, that are impacted. Uh, you've got society, and then when you begin to even unpack that, you have the environment, uh, you have the government in, in terms of taxes, um, and then you just have the impact that the actual innovation is making on uh, society at large, right? So if you think about the impact of uh, social media on uh, the younger uh, generation, uh, some could argue that, oh man, that uh, uh, addiction to social media often falls in the, it's in the negative uh, impact. And so organizations from a social standpoint are impacting so many different stakeholders and it's incredibly difficult uh, to measure. Uh, so I think the first would be understand how your innovation and organization is impacting each of those, impacting your employees, impacting your customers, uh, investors, uh, and society at large, whether it's the environment, uh, taxes, um, and just how your innovation impacts uh, uh, people. And I think it's important to have an honest assessment uh, so that if there are ne negative externalities you, uh, of your innovation, uh, you can begin uh, to rectify those. And so an example uh, would be how um, BHP and Shell uh, and ESCOM, uh, major sort of uh, energy uh, companies are now tying executive compensation uh, with sort of the, uh, the carbon footprint uh, impact that these organizations are having. Uh, 
you know, historically, it was just you know, quarterly earnings, financials for the most part. But when you begin to tie compensation to these social impacts that you as an organization have uh, defined that is, is incredibly important, uh, then we can begin to see uh, change uh, happening. Um, you know, a couple, a couple more points here. Um, you know, Microsoft uh, is another example of a company that's thinking not about maybe carbon footprint as much as say Shell, but they're thinking about diversity, right? If you think about the lack of diversity in tech, uh, Microsoft is saying, we will now tie uh, executive pay to diversity issues because that's the social uh, uh, impact that that organization, at least in the, in the short term, is looking uh, to make. Um, and so, so, you know, defining social social impact is key and important. Um, it's different for different organizations because they have different social footprints uh, on uh, society and those uh, stakeholders. Uh, but ensuring that whatever that footprint is, you're able to tie realistic metrics uh, that influence the way employees uh, behave is critical. Uh, if we don't do that, it's going to be really difficult to make any any sort of uh, change. Absolutely. And I think that the point you brought up about um, putting actual structures in place to make sure that these agendas, which are inherently long term in many cases, are followed through upon is a really a critical piece. Uh, Carolina, can we also get your thoughts on this issue? I'd like to add on Efosa's point that uh, was very well done from the point of view of uh, uh, the responsibility of leadership and the self-assessment plus metrics. Uh, I would like to add two components. Uh, it's very hard only for companies to do self-assessment, um, not because they are not uh, committed with the, with the agenda, but uh, there's a natural bias. And you have seen for, for like decades, companies do their sustainability reports in a way that uh, they try to convey the notion that, uh, of course, I'm worried with my stakeholders, while we know that uh, is much more like a justification mindset than actually a transformation mindset. And my thesis is that sometimes companies truly believe they're already doing an impact, a social impact, because they employ people. So I'm generating jobs, come on. I'm, I'm, I'm doing my social impact. So there's an education, educational agenda for leaders to understanding the social impact go beyond employing uh, people or generating uh, short-term prosperity. And, uh, and, and actually, we have to show this is the good for business. Uh, for example, I'd like to give the example in Brazil that we are living right now, and it's a huge polemic in the business sector, that our, one of our giant retailers called Magazine Luiza decided to make a trainee selection only for black people. Like only black people can apply. And then they said, I I we wanted to, to really create a shock. We wanted to correct years and years of giving much more space and opportunities to the white. And uh, what was interesting was the reaction of society. Many people saying this is racism on the reverse. So when you see a company like Magazine Luiza taking the leadership of saying, look, social impact is much more than employing people. I have to really be diverse in the way I select people. And I'm going to take a statement and uh, I'm going to make a position on the topic. They are creating a new way of looking at social impact. And this is very educating to the, to the market, to the, to the other sectors. And other companies are following Magazine Luiza. So when I, when I talk, when Efasa talks about leadership, I talk about, I wanted to add that leadership is not only within company, but between companies. Companies themselves can be, can be leaders on actions that really produce 
a broader understanding what, what is the meaning of social impact. And talking about metrics and self-assessment, I see with good eyes, although we have to follow closely because I'm a professor of critical thinking, so that investors, especially institutional investors, are more and more charging companies for ESG disclosure, social impact disclosure, looking at lots of indicators that are not commonly captured in the traditional financial uh, self-assessment. So this is also a way to help companies understand what social impact can mean, what an ESG can mean from a material perspective. And at the same time, we see some institutions across the world as SASB in the United States, uh, providing mechanisms to give a materiality on those variables. So we can also help companies to understand and educate themselves on the meaning of social impact. But uh, I think the main message is that uh, I wouldn't, I, I would think that uh, it's kind of uh, relevant to start by saying companies that social impact is much more than employing people, which it seems obvious to us, but many companies will look at, will look at the topic and, and have a very genuine difficulty in assuming that they are far from the agenda while sometimes they are totally focused on what for us is a very, it's very limited view of social impact. Uh, I, I completely hear what you're saying. And I also think that from the consumer point of view, when companies make these statements, however sincere and don't follow it up with action in terms of how their business really operates, how they design, how they communicate. Um, they're very quickly called out by, uh, you know, larger society. But this is an interesting question. I think even pre-COVID, there was really no shortage of capital and good intentions kind of dedicated to this idea of making the world a better place. I and mean, we have 210 signatories to the giving pledge from 23 countries, you know, $1.3 trillion in assets. We have a lot of new structures like B Corps. We have instruments like impact investing. We have really, really high rates of volunteerism in the United States and many other countries. And now because of, you know, all the unrest in a few months, we've seen even companies like Citi saying, we're going to pledge, you know, a billion dollars to close the racial wealth gap, for example. And, and many others have out, outlined very specific initiatives. But how does this idea of social impact and purpose, how can it really shape the innovation agenda as well um, inside companies? Because that is, I think, when it becomes tangible and, you know, able to have an impact in society when people see a change that's that's very tangible. That's when it becomes real to consumers and even investors. So, uh, Ifosa, can I hear some of your thoughts on that? Absolutely. Um, I think the the way this uh, notion of social impact can begin to shape uh, the innovation agenda is it sort of goes back to the initial point that Carolina made. Uh, it really has to be an intentional part of an organization's strategy. It, it's not a, it's not a um, it would be nice if we did this. No, it would be stepping back and doing a, sort of a diagnostic on the activities of a firm, the products we sell, how we sell those products, the impact it has on our customers, on the environment, and putting this notion of social impact right there smack dab in the middle. Uh, and then, and then you begin to make decisions uh, that, and, and you see how those decisions impact the social impact. So, you know, if I were a manager at a firm and I wanted to invest uh, in a new uh, technology or a product or an innovation, I go to my manager and I say, hey, I think this would be great. One of the questions they're bound to ask me is, okay, how much is it going to cost us? When are we going to realize the returns? Uh, what kind of resources do we need? Um, well, you know, they, they, the, 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 the conversation will focus primarily on the financial metrics. Until those conversations begin to focus on 
the social impact metrics, it's going to be incredibly uh, difficult. Now, one example of a firm that's doing this and doing this uh, uh, quite well is, is Philips, you know, big uh, multinational uh, company. And, you know, it, one of the businesses Philips uh, engages in is it's a very basic business. It's lighting. And so it's, uh, you know, I mean, they're not making the lights that are allowing us to see each other today, but, you know, it's, it's very simple, light. How can you possibly make that even more sustainable? I mean, with the exception of making more, um, uh, um, more uh, energy uh, efficient, efficient lights, uh, one of the things they've done is uh, fundamentally change that business model. Uh, so they no longer would uh, completely sell the assets to you, but they would come in to your organization or your building uh, they would provide the lights as energy efficient as possible. You as the customer will pay for when the lights are on, when they're used. Uh, and when it's time to recycle, when it's time to replace uh, the lights, they come in and they replace the lights. Now think about how that business model is fundamentally different from a business model where you come in, uh, you sell a bunch of lights, and then when the lights, uh, you know, go out, they reach the end of life, the company uh, that's using them, uh, you know, essentially just replaces them and, and, and disposes of them. Now, Philips is thinking about its business model differently. It's no longer selling the asset. It's now selling uh, essentially use of the asset. And so it's incentivized as an organization to make sure those lights last a lot longer. It's incentivized as an organization to design the lights in such a way that they don't cost the company uh, more money than they should, because this is no longer a one-time uh, transaction, if you will, right? And so everything ab about its business model is different. From the customer standpoint, uh, I'm happier uh, because I don't have this significant outlay at the onset in terms of my uh, light, uh, uh, my, my, my light uh, purchases. Um, I'm also doing my part in making the environment a uh, much better, better place. Um, and you can see how it changes the way uh, even, you know, not just Philips, but the customers begin to think about uh, the purchases they make. Um, I can imagine a customer going to other suppliers saying, you know, here's how we, we currently pay for light. Can, you know, how, can, you, can you do this? Or what, what, what can you do in, the, in this regard? Um, so everybody uh, sort of uh, wins. Um, and so it's, it's a process, but if, you know, to your question, if we don't develop innovations, um, and not just product innovations, business model innovations that have social impact at the core. Uh, I think it's really gonna be incredibly difficult uh, for us to, to make the switch, uh, right? I mean, this is, you know, I know we'll, we'll, we may talk about, you know, the governments and, and multi-party stakeholders, but I think from a company standpoint, it has to be at the center of the strategy. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, there's, we'll get into some of the challenges and opportunities in doing that. But first, I would like to hear uh, from Carolina about how, you know, impact and, and uh, purpose can really shape the innovation agenda. I'll make a little joke with the world by making social the agenda. What I mean <laughs> by that, we have a fabulous methodology called design thinking that unfortunately, uh, although the mental model is totally geared toward involving different stakeholders in conceiving new ways of thinking a business or thinking a product or so forth, most of the times is directed to the very end of the solution design process. So I think when you, uh, when you were talking about, we were talking about leadership uh, earlier on, uh, when you transform the leader in not the one who has the answer, but as a designer of answers, and, and this is a, is a very disruptive way to see leadership, because although we, we, we know that leaders have a huge responsibility on transformation, 
that doesn't mean that they have to have the answers. They have to be excellent designers and they have to build governance. And this is like the G that we call it, ESG, that bring the social within the design thinking of the company. So not because I'm thinking of a product of our process or whatever, but as, as the father said, when I'm conceiving the business model in which I'm gonna operate as a company, who am I gonna to bring to be part of this design process? It has to be the whole social environment. It has to be my clients, my investors, my uh, possible clients that is not in my horizon right now, but they can become my, my customers and so forth. So there's no way to make social impact without having the social as part of the design agenda. And uh, there's no way of the design agenda to be powerful if the mindset of the leader is not of the, a designer more than the person who has the answers. Um, so I think the combination of uh, the way that leadership operates more as a designer, uh, the, the way the governance is built, thanks to the way the leader thinks governance and putting the social in the center of discussion in the design process, I think the combination of these three elements is what really uh, adds to what Fossa said, to the really thinking in a more systemic fashion of how to reconceive business for social impact. No, I think what both of you um, have said is really important, but it's also a huge challenge because I think previously leadership was judged on how well you shepherd your own organization, how well you motivate people inside, do you produce something of quality? And I think a lot of the changing metrics of how we judge organizations are, are also mirroring how we're looking at countries itself. We're not looking at GDP per capita, as a static measure and a singular measure of how well countries are are doing right we are looking at gender equality at broadband access at entrepreneurial capability many many filters that we didn't have earlier and so it's become a much more complex task so how and i think we're also today looking to leaders to become kind of creators of common ground, right? I mean, they're the ones who synthesize all these different tensions. Well, if I'm a car designer, I do need to take into account the views of environmentalists. If I'm, uh, you know, designing a, a meat product, I still have to treat my animals ethically, knowing that many people have, uh, you know, views about vegetarianism, for example. So many of the issues that companies are trying to weigh in on today you know, don't have set answers, they're, they're changing values, there's, uh, you know, no singular understanding of what does equality mean, what does, you know, gender parity look like. So my question is, how do organizations that now have to deliver on these wider social issues, how do they go about a learning journey? Where do they start? How do they find collaborators? And how do they shepherd those relationships effectively. Uh, Ifosa, I'll let you start. Yeah, I mean, so the good thing is, um, you know, there's a plethora of information out there on this. Uh, there's, you know, certainly the Impact Investing Network. Uh, there's a lot of research has been done uh, on this particular topic. In fact, uh, in the most recent uh, edition of the Harvard Business Review, I think September, October, uh, we had a uh, Harvard Business School professor, uh, George Serafim, published an article titled, uh, Making Sustainability Count. And in the article, he discusses how we really do need to transition from a world that talks about sustainability uh, in a way that is separate from the organization doing business to a world where sustainability is the business. Uh, we, we, we have to inculcate that into our organization. Um, and he's done a ton of research on ESG metrics uh, and models and collaborated with a lot of uh, different uh, professors and other, other experts in the field. And so the good thing is there is a lot of information out there. That's one. 
the second uh, thing uh, I will say is uh, partnering uh, is absolutely essential when it comes to uh, this notion of uh, improving uh, your social impact uh, f f footprint, uh, I would say. Um, and, but partnering looks differently uh, depending on what the goals are. Um, and so there's a book uh, by uh, Steve Schmida uh, of Resonance. Uh, it's a, an advisory consulting group. Uh, the book's titled Partner with Purpose. And he talks about the different ways you, you as an organization can partner with different stakeholders uh, to fulfill a particular mission. Because again, we have to remember uh, if I were a company like Starbucks or, or, um, or even Pepsi, sustainability and social impact to me uh, means something very different than if I were uh, Chevron uh, or even Ikea, right? And so sustainability and thinking about this notion of social impact will force these organizations to engage and interface with different players in a more intimate way than they do now. And so the farmers uh, who are growing coffee in Kenya or Rwanda or Uganda are no longer just my simple suppliers. I think about those individuals, their lives, when, when I wanna decide uh, to offer a new brand of coffee. Uh, right, I, I think about my social impact on a much deeper uh, level. And so it will sort of force me to partner with uh, other stakeholders in a way that uh, I, I currently don't as an organization. Uh, and so understanding how to partner is key. And, and I think Steve uh, does an excellent job uh, in his book. Uh, the last thing I would uh, like to mention here is uh, the notion of fair compensation. Um, I don't mean to be crude, uh, but if we don't figure out a way to compensate organizations uh, or punish uh, organizations, and this sort of trickles down into the employees within these organizations, uh, then we're gonna keep talking about social, social impact, social mission, and so on. I mean. You look at the world today and look at from an environmental standpoint, how many wildfires we're having on an annual basis. I'm uh, in California, I know. <laughs> you go, you go, right? uh, look at the flooding, uh, look at desertification in the Sahel region in Africa, uh, the locust uh, issues we're having there. I mean, the, the, these issues are front and center for us today. Yet, um, we, many of us would argue we are slow uh, to make progress, the kind of progress we need to make. I mean, COVID-19 has shut down a lot of, uh, you know, transportation in the world. And so the, the environment gets a little bit of a breather, right? We needed a global pandemic for that to happen. <laughs> um, so, so, so if we see all these things happening, we see rising inequality, we see environmental damage, and we're not doing enough. Uh, what it means is there's a critical piece in the puzzle that's missing. And we have to figure out a way to compensate organizations that do an excellent job um, and punish organizations that don't. Until we do that, it's, it's not impossible. It's just going to be really, really difficult to make the kind of progress we hope uh, to make. Yeah, I think that's a very important issue, Fosan, and it's an important question more so even now because I think we've operated then the assumption that firms are guardians of immense talent and immense capital and that somehow um, they would be the natural leaders in this process. Um, but if we look at what has happened inside many organizations, even well-respected ones, um, you know, you see the CEO who makes the line worker salary in a matter of days. Um, we see kind of a level of inequality that few governments have actually managed to create, even in countries that we don't respect very much. Um, so this is a real challenge. I mean, I, I don't know that any of us has answers, but it's an important issue um, to highlight. And uh, Carolina, I would love to hear from you as well. Is how does a company 
really start on this learning journey of, um, you know, kind of understanding, as Ifosa says, it's different by industry, but how do I come to understand what my sphere of influence is, where I can have impact, where I can maximize it, um, and how do I co-create many of these solutions? I think that's critical in the success and sustainability of many of these projects. I'd like to add the two actors that uh, for me are key for this transformation and they are outside the company because company themselves, they definitely can be important um, ch model changes, um, but there's a limit uh, that is due to my current repertoire or to the way I, I, I whether I've been punished or not for certain uh, decisions I make. Uh, so in that regard, that is important to have uh, a, an alignment system, uh, incentive system, aligning incentive system that produces this change. I think investors might have an important role, especially institutional investors, pension funds uh, of countries in the way they're going to be charging companies and doing this punishment or this rewarding based on how companies uh, position themselves in that agenda. But there's a player we didn't mention that is very important to the equation, that is the government. Yes. So, and for me, it has everything to do with a moral agenda. Uh, I don't want to talk about morality in a, in a philosophical way, but I like always to cite the Nobel Prize from economics, Fogel, won the Nobel Prize in 93, that uh, presented an econometric study showing that by the time, like the end of the 18th century, that uh, uh, United, uh, United Kingdom positioned uh, as a country against slavery, slavery itself was a very profitable business. So if it was due to profitability, very difficult for companies to go against it, even though employees within the companies could be against it. But as a system, the inertia was geared towards profitability. So what made the change? Politicians, women, people yes. who were behind the scenes who said, this is immoral. We cannot afford to have a society based on slavery. So from, of course, it was not something from day to night, from night to day, it was something that took decades uh, and was leader, was led by Wilberforce. The, the government just position is, is, is something that we won't accept. And immediately it becomes a passive. They said, uh, that if, you, if your business is based on slavery, you were wrong, you have, you, you're, gonna, you're not gonna operate anymore. So I believe government can be a very strong force uh, putting the price on things that produces, um, that produces an agenda that is against the environment and against the social. And so regulation, so legislation, so politicians who really gonna put limits and uh, work as punishment or rewarding for business who are operating uh, to produce more social and, and environmental prosperity. So just, uh, I think this is important, like uh, talking about partners or like uh, forces, I would say uh, the moral force behind uh, the government, behind the consumers and investors who I see as a little bit of a skepticism uh, because they also look for profitability, for profitability, but in a sense that they are, for example, I like to talk about pension funds because they have an intergenerational mandate. So they cannot afford not looking at, for example, climate risks, because this is a, talking about fiduciary duty. This is part of their fiduciary duty. I cannot just look at short term. I'm taking care of uh, like several generations uh, um, uh, uh, resources. So I have to be very careful about cl climate risks and so forth. So I see, I see as a combination of this, these other sources as very effective for, for the agenda to, to become real. 
No, I think that's a, an, a tremendously important point. And we can see many cases where the impact has been amplified when governments and companies have worked together and they've really diluted one another's potential impact when they've been at cross purposes. And, you know, I, I started out in economics and came to business. And I, I think there's this, uh, you know, if I were to summarize it, say that, you know, economists really understand this incentives and business really tries to understand aspirations. If you unite those two, you can have very powerful and very rapid um, change. But I, I will not belabor this point before going to the next one. But I think the challenge of metrics with multi-party systems is, is very real because a company is geared toward growth and, you know, they're, they're kind of doing basketball scoring. And a lot of social service organizations, you know, if you're giving prosthetic legs or you're just, you know, dealing with hunger or child trafficking, you should be aiming to make the problem go away. So you're not interested in saying, <laughs> you know, I, I've uh, helped, you know, 50, you know, percent more people. I'm like, you know, you don't want to ex actually exacerbate the problem. You need to gradually, you know, eliminate the, the need for that service. So that introduces... Um, complications that are are very real um, that need to be dealt with. But let's switch to another topic simply because I know both of you have such a depth of experience in technology. I know Ifosa, you started out as a computer engineer, and I know Carolina, you've, you have such a depth in STEM and in cognition. What COVID has done um, and what was being addressed even earlier is this whole digital divide issue. There's tremendous opportunity because on one hand, for the first time, we have a global payments infrastructure. We have 5 billion cell phones. We have social media. We have a lot of tools that could potentially accelerate change. Um, but, you know, Microsoft to this week released data saying that, you know, we know even in the United States, there are 162 million people who are not accessing the internet at optimal broadband speeds. 21 million people don't have, um, you know, good internet access. So we know that there is um, a digital divide that's very real on a global basis because now that may be our only <laughs> means to communicate for the foreseeable future. So now that we have big data for rich and poor in some sense, you know, what are some of the ways we can leverage it? How has technology helped and hurt us? And, and what can we do better? Broad question. So I'm completely leaving it um, up to both of you to share your thoughts. Ifos, I'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, what we're seeing uh, in the world today is that if you were doing uh, well before the pandemic, if you had access before the pandemic, uh, you, you know, the access you have uh, has been uh, amplified in some way, or at the very least has remained the same. Um, and so, you know, I had access uh, to the internet, uh, to decent broadband, transportation, and so on. And now I work from home primarily because I have that access. And the resources I used to spend uh, to go out, to get to work, to travel, I have more of that. And so I can spend more time with my family. I can spend um, more time with friends, social distanced, of course. <laughs> um, but I have more time, right, uh, at my hand. So I have more access to the things that uh, many of us in the world would, would crave, um, saving more and so on. Now, if you did not have access before the pandemic, if you had two or three jobs where you had to go somewhere, uh, you couldn't simply work from home. Uh, you can imagine now how uh, some of those folks have lost jobs. Uh, some of that access has been taken away and they might actually be spending a little bit more money uh, in order to do the things that historically uh, they used to do a lot easier. And I'm talking about uh, prosperous countries, right? Um, I'm not even talking about emerging economies where um, the concept of, of working from home or even schooling from home, uh, it's, it's almost laughable, uh, you know, and you have no access to electricity, uh, much less, you know, broadband. Uh, you've got five, six people living in, in a one-room uh, one uh, building or home. 
And so this is an opportunity for us to step back and think about ways we can leverage technology to provide access. The key has to be, how can we leverage technology in a way that can provide access to people who historically did not have access? Because technology is always going to it's going to have uh, externalities, it's going to have positive and, and negative effects. That's just a fact of, of, of anything you introduce in life. But we have to ask ourselves the question now, leaders have to say, how can I improve access to healthcare via technology in my country, in my city? How can I improve access uh, to education, uh, you know, digitally, uh, considering what the pandemic has done? And that should then drive our strategy and the decisions that we make going forward. Um, I can talk about this for hours, but let, let me uh, pass it over to uh, Carolina to, to, to give her points as well. But no, it's important. I would uh, summarize by saying that it was not, it was not conceived to be, technology was always thought to be something that would give access, uh, would generate prosperity, would generate uh, resources, but in reality, technology today is one of the biggest barriers to social impact. I can talk from, this, for, from someone who lives in Brazil. During the pandemics, we had uh, millions and millions of children without access to, to internet and losing school, not having access to school at all. Uh, almost uh, 250 days without school which is gonna give, a, give us a huge, um, yeah, huge challenge in really catch up with everything they lost. We, we see that uh, workers from the urban areas um, not having good internet access and needing to go to the office because it's where they can work. So, and I, and I, and I fear that most of the home office is going to end up being a very, uh, is, is going to be another engineering. Remember the, the, the re-engineering of the 80s? Many companies will find out that they have employees that can just, uh, just they just execute tasks and they don't need to be like full-time employees. They can just be hired to execute a particular task. So I'm really afraid of uh, um, a strong impact on employment. Uh, when companies realize that they can really cast like categories of employees, the ones who I really need to have in the office and the others that uh, it's okay if they work at home. Uh, so I think for all this to work uh, in the direction we want to see technology as a means to prosperity, to inclusion, to access to resources, um, we have to look at the human side of it. So we have to build trust relationship. So we, I, I followed a study from an institution here in Brazil, academic institution in Brazil, that interviewed lots of employees who were very worried about how, they're gonna, how, how they're gonna be measured by their bosses. How my boss will know what I'm doing here if I'm in, in like working from home. And this all reveals that if you trust relationships, if, I, if a culture of trust, mm -hmm. if, I, if a human-centric culture is not in place, technology won't produce social impact. It's going to be the exact opposite. It's going to produce lack of access. It's going to produce lack of trust. It's going to produce different types of employees and not like uh, generating like uh, equality. And it has nothing to do with diversity as well, especially social, social economic diversity, because we know some people won't have the same type of uh, access to, to, to resources as others. So, so I think technology becomes more than ever a human agenda. So how are we gonna treat technology to be geared towards humanity, inclusion, diversity, merit, Otherwise, it's going to really be one of the biggest barriers to social impact. 
Now, thank you both so much. Um, I think you've given us a lot to think about. And I think that both of you really reinforced the point that social impact and purpose when they are embraced can drive innovation, it can drive profits, and it can actually help us step toward a lot of the larger goals we have as individual firms and as a society as well. And it's just important to keep in mind at every stage the impact of our actions because it's becoming very clear that the things that we do and fail to do have generational consequences. And I think that is something that should um, force us to think very deeply about who we collaborate with, who we're answerable to in the long term. And I'd like to close with a, uh, a quote from Peter Drucker, who famously said, you know, the bottom line for nonprofits is transformed lives. And I think increasingly that is going to be the yardstick by which all organizations will be measured. And uh, thank you both so much for your contributions and um, I look forward to keeping in touch with both of you. Same. Thank, Thank you. you very much. It was a pleasure.